so when we look at decisions, you might say that that there's, according to the Course of Jesus, there's wrong-minded decisions and right-minded decisions. And wrong-minded decisions are simply decisions where you give your mind, your mind's allegiance to the ego. And you say, I give you the power. Uh, I, I choose for you. And the consequence of that is always fear and pain and shame and guilt and so on and so forth. And then aligning with the Holy Spirit, there's only a sense of joy when you make decisions with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus has, in the back of his text, he has rules for decision. Very practical way to train your mind to make decisions with the Holy Spirit. In fact, his first two rules for decision uh, is basically, the first one is decide the kind of day you want. That's pretty straightforward when you think about it. From Jesus, this is like a manual for training your mind. Decide the kind of day you want. And then number two, is if I make no decisions by myself, this is the day that will be given me. In other words, he's saying, you can decide the kind of day you want, peaceful, joyful, or happy, since the theme of this workshop is, this retreat is, God's will for me is perfect happiness. If I decide that I want a happy day, and number two, if I make no decisions by myself, then I will have a happy day. I, I have to experience a happy day according to those first two rules for decision. Now the ego belief system is, you could say it, it taints decision making so that whether you're aware of it or not, if you're plugged into the ego and you're believing in the ego, you may even believe that you're alive in this world, but in the sense, if you're choosing with the ego, we could say you're like among the walking dead. We call this zombies in some of these scary movies, <laughs> The Walking Dead or The Zombies. It seems like you're alive and making lots of important decisions as you move through your daily life and living a life between birth and death. But whenever you're choosing with the ego, you're reinforcing the belief in death in your mind. Because the ego is a death wish. You know, we could say it's, it's an illusory belief, the belief in separation from God, but it's a death wish. So, the whole point of working with A Course in Miracles is to train your mind to be in complete alignment with the Holy Spirit. And we could call forgiveness, or the miracle, or the right mind, or the atonement, instead of a death wish, we'll call it a life wish. It's not truly life. I mean, what is life is eternal. It's way beyond a decision. Eternity doesn't really involve decisions. But in order to come back into that remembrance of eternity, you have to choose the life wish. You have to choose the miracle. And not only do you have to choose the miracle, but it's a training your mind to become habitually miracle-minded. So that you're thinking in alignment with God, or the majority of your thoughts as you move through the day, you want to be miracle-minded. So, you, you train your mind, you kind of wean it away from the death wish by learning how to decide with the Holy Spirit. In fact, there's a song that uh, JP and, and Helena work with, what is it called? Decide for Me, Holy Spirit. Decide for Me, a beautiful song that came, came filtering through. And the prayer of the heart would be, Holy Spirit, decide for God for me. Because the Holy Spirit is the bridge back to that eternity. The Holy Spirit knows the way. The Holy Spirit is the remembrance of that love in our mind. It's like that spark that could never be put out in a darkened mind. It's still there. And when we give ourselves over to it, we, we open up to becoming more and more consistently miracle-minded. And that will say your happiness uh, it is really not a matter of degree, but just for a moment we'll say as if there is degrees, your happiness is proportionate with the extent to which you're choosing the right mind. The more habitually right-minded you are, the more habitually happy you are. And I'm not talking happy because you got a promotion, or happy because you met your soulmate, or happy because it's a sunny day, or happy because you like this particular form. We're talking about happy for no earthly reason. You're so happy you can't even think of a reason to be happy. 
that's another characteristic of the Holy Spirit's happiness. You can't even think of a reason why you're that happy. Because it's really inspired by God. It's not inspired by anything in form. And it's not inspired by any outcome. You know, it's absolutely completely independent of outcomes. It wouldn't matter what was seeming to happen in form. You know, you're happy for no good reason. For no reason at all in terms of the world. But you're happy because of your alignment with Source. So, in one sense, you know, what seems to be a very complicated, puzzling picture on Earth is really just an opportunity to clarify your decision making and to learn how to let go of the attraction to those ego decisions and to turn your decision making capacity back over to the Holy Spirit. Where you say, like in rule for decision number two, if I make no decisions by myself, this is the day that will be given me. It's, it sounds really quantum, it's almost it's scientific. <laughs> the more the more consistently you choose the right mind, the more consistently you're happy. You know, it's really a real simple, basic kind of equation. So, why does it seem so tricky, if it's, if it's just a matter of that? It's because the ego has made up a world in which there are things in this world that seem attractive to the sleeping mind. I mean, if you saw that this world and all of the decisions and all of the pursuits of this world were just roadways to death. If you saw that every single roadway of the world, without exception, led to death, was just guilt in some kind of disguise, it, it makes the final decision pretty easy. It's only because the ego has made up a lot of pseudo-happiness, pseudo-pleasures, pseudo-joys, that don't have anything to do with true joy, or true peace, true happiness, and there's, you know, when somebody says, what about pleasure, you know, all pleasure comes from doing God's will, you know, we're pretty familiar with that, that line, all real pleasure comes from doing God's will, that's where the alignment comes back in. So, what we're doing as we go through all this mind training, is we're really getting convinced that the world we see holds nothing that we want. As long as we still think there's something attractive about the world, then that means the trick is still working, you know. Because we're just binding our mind to guilt by still thinking that there's something worthy of salvation, or there's something that's going to be the saving grace here in the world. Again, I was looking at the, the Cathar book again today that Elizabeth gave me, and uh, it's kind of interesting when you go back to the Gnostics, you know, around the first century, the Gnostics uh, didn't believe the world was real. Uh, and then, if you look, if you follow it years later, when you get into the, like the 1100 with the Cathars, it was the same thing. That God did not create the world. The world came from something else. They, what, what they called it like a, was it a demi, demiurge or demigod or something like that. But they're, they weren't trying to pin this world onto God anymore. And, uh, like Elizabeth was saying, the Cathars were often referred to as dualists because there was good and there was evil. But the interesting thing about that was what they were calling evil, they were calling illusion. I mean, they were like taking these deep metaphysics to heart, like, well, wait a minute now. If God is all-knowing and all-loving and all-powerful, if God is good, if God is perfect, they reasoned, how could an imperfect world come from a perfect God? And their conclusion? It couldn't. <laughs> it couldn't. So, they realized that the Son of God, or the Christ, must be pure spirit, and God must be pure spirit, and they even went so far to say that pure spirit couldn't even incarnate into matter. They said Jesus was an illusion. Talk about early philosophers. <laughs> Jesus is an, is an illusion. Now you can imagine how it went over in, in to the Catholic Church uh, about 1100. Some of you might have heard of the Inquisition, burnings at stakes. This is where they were beheading people. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins? 
you know, like the stuff you hear nowadays on the televangelists. But if you don't answer the question right, <laughs> you get burned at the stake or you get your head lopped off. Right there, no questions asked. Like, wrong answer. <laughs> Boom. You know, this is like, but of course, you, they were protecting a theology, you know. It's kind of like they, you know, it was a theology and it was like, the, it was a big thing going then, you know. Church, church and state and power and God and all this and that. And so... So then they went further to say, you know, that's why I was talking earlier about the perfects. The perfects didn't marry because what is marriage but union, right? If you're perfect, if you are perfect union, how can you improve upon that? Oh, I'm, I'm, I've got, I am perfect union. I'm just going to uh, increase my unionhood here. Uh, I need a wife. I need a husband to increase my unionhood. You know, it's like ridiculous. That's what the Cathars believed. It was ridiculous. They didn't believe in that. They weren't really big on sex either. Sex and procreation was part of the Demiurge's trick to keep the illusion going. <laughs> Talk about, you know, taking a vow of, of chastity. They're like beyond that. They're just saying, no, 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 it's, it's a trick. Think about all the guilt that mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers have. Mothers trying to be ideal mothers, trying to measure up and be good mothers to their children and good fathers and children trying to be good little boys and girls, to not disappoint mommy and daddy, to make them proud, and on and on and on, all the layers and levels, all being part of a giant smoke screen to guard against the remembrance of divine love. When you share forgiveness, you literally share this healing belief that sees that Everything is unified. It's like the quantum field. That there's nothing outside of it, and there's nothing apart from it. You might say that it's a healing belief because it simply recognizes that all is mind. What does that do to matter? You know, isn't there mind and matter, or mind over matter? Uh, no, the Cathars had it again. They said there's nothing to matter. That's why Jesus couldn't exist. Because... Jesus is spirit, and you can't have spirit and matter. One is eternal, and one is temporary. So you see the distinction. Now, of course, you see why that did not go over well. <laughs> and, and you could say, and, and again, that if you start following the Course in Miracles, in terms of just a basic theology, that only God is real, only love is real, and everything else is an illusion, like the Carol King song, uh, what you're going to find is this is not going to go go over very popular. Uh, try and telling that to mom and dad, you know, it's like, but you're not, you don't have to tell it to anybody. All you have to do is experience it. This is not like a theology to be passed on to others. Okay, let's all hold hands and and sing together and 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 come up with some kind of theology. It's like you simply remove the attachment to these thoughts and beliefs, and then you feel the peace and bliss by not investing in them anymore. You, Jesus says in the workbook, you smile more frequently. Your forehead is serene. No wonder. It's because your thoughts are not crazy. <laughs> you know, your thoughts are, are in alignment. That's why your forehead is serene. Your, your smile is peaceful. The other thing is, it's kind of just another way of gazing or looking upon the world. So, think how peaceful it is when you don't have the need to change the world. You don't have the need to promote an opinion, or promote a theology, or promote a belief system. It's really peaceful when you don't have to promote anything. You know, you, then you can really accept what is, because you're not there with an agenda. You know, you walk in and you come there and you, you simply have no agenda whatsoever. You don't have something in mind that you're hoping will happen. You know, it's not like you go into a hall and you say, Okay, how many of you brothers and sisters would like to know Jesus Christ? Come on down to the front of the stage and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You don't need all that stuff. Because there is no personal Savior. You know, we're letting go of the personal, we're not trying to save souls. 
All we're doing is we're opening in our mind to the awareness that there's only one soul. And that we are it. We share that soul with God. We share that soul. It's synonymous with spirit. That's what soul is. As soon as you start to bring it back into incarnational ideas and reincarnational, then it's getting away from the essence of soul. I can never figure that out. How can a soul, how can a spirit incarnate into flesh? You know, I, I thought, wow, it's something that's so expansive, squeezing down into flesh. I mean, I would even hear people say, you know, when, when someone dies, they measure the body, and it weighs less. <laughs> Is this supposed to be like scientific evidence of, of how much a soul weighs? Point one ounce or something, you know? You know, though the soul is not contained in matter, the soul is the is an experience of the of the allness of what is and the nothingness of, of anything else that would claim to be a part. So it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, journey, but it's really a journey in emptying the mind of these ego investments is really what it comes down to. And think of it, you know, when Jesus said in the Bible you know, if somebody smites you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. That's pretty defenseless. Like, smack! There you go. <laughs> that's, that's pretty, I mean, you can imagine in, in the day and age where they're crucifying people, and sometimes crucifying people upside down. That's got to be the way to go. Upside down, <laughs> crucified upside down. You can imagine of all the ways you can think. Of. And and Jesus is saying, turn the other cheek. Uh, if somebody asks for your coat, offer him your cloak as well. Like no limit. Like, and then, um, you know, be as little children, or in more modern terms, with the Course in Miracles. In my defenselessness, my safety lies. What a beautiful lesson. In my defenselessness, my safety lies. Now, how would that make any sense unless I was identifying with my spirit, with the spirit? You couldn't make any sense. That seems to be the most illogical teaching on the planet. Unless you, you know that there's something called the spirit that you're identified with. And that the spirit needs no defense. In fact, if you start defending the spirit, that just means you don't know the spirit. <laughs> you must think the spirit's vulnerable to be protecting and defending the spirit. And the presence, the I am presence, is before time was. You know, before Abraham was, I am. It's, it's, it's so pristine and innocent and completely untouched by anything of time, that it certainly doesn't need... Uh, defense. And that's been the joy of my journey with the travel to all these countries and going to all these places and meeting these different people is because I was having the experience of my reality of the spirit and the, that the world was, was like fiction. It was like a novel. It was, it was just purely fictional. That way I could go to different countries, herbal countries or whether there's a civil war going on, or this or that, or actually, people were very gracious. Like when I was in Colombia, I, I was staying in a little rural community with armed gunmen, uh, with the guns, you know, guarding the compound uh, where I was staying. And I would go in and out. I had to go in and out there every day. Guns, 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 guns. But guns are fun when they're fiction. You can, I could like wave. <laughs> I would like wave at the gunman and they would like wave back at me, you know, it's, it's a reflection of mind. Some of you know, like even if, if there seems to be a growling, snarling animal coming at you, if you are fearless, if you have a complete sense of defenselessness, there is nothing stronger than your mind in a state of fearlessness. There is nothing that can harm a child of God that is fearless. We were talking the other day that, that when you have fear in your mind, it's, it's an illusion, but more than that, Jesus says you, you, know, you are, are useless to the plan of salvation uh, when you're fearful. 
Nothing like being told you're useless, you know, if, if you're identified with fear. That'll get you fired up about, about fearlessness, about getting into the joy. Okay, all right, all right, I'll clear my mind of fear. I want to be useful. I want to, I want to have something that is truly contributing something meaningful and value. And now you're telling me that it doesn't matter what I accumulate, whatever I possess in this world, I can't take it with me, because it never was there in the first place. That's why you can't take it with you, because you, it was just a, a mirage. It was a mirage and it had no intrinsic value whatsoever. I remember the first time I was reading, uh, going through the workbook, and uh, I got to, I think it was Lesson 133, I Will Not Value the Valueless, and Jesus starts to lay the criteria in that workbook lesson, between what is valuable and what is valueless. And, you know, when you first are going through it, you're like, oh, right! I had to read 133 lessons to get to this, but now this is what I've been asking for. I want Divine Spirit to teach me the difference between what is valuable and what is valueless. If I can get it straight from the source, and I can get that straight, if I can just get that one distinction, that one discernment, that would make things so much easier. Okay, God, cut the chase. Let's give it to me straight. Hit me with your best shot. Come on. I'm going to read Lesson 133, what's the difference between what's valuable and what's valueless. And he says in that lesson that if it will last forever, it is valuable. And if it will not last forever, it has no value whatsoever. <laughs> and it's like, damn! <laughs> Hit me with your best shot. <laughs> Whoa, is that a distinction? Now, who is going to make that distinction except the Holy Spirit? No human being is capable of making that distinction. And, and we could say that, in one sense, the human being is a contradiction of terms, because being is spiritual, and human is material. And the material has no value whatsoever, and the spiritual has all value. So, as we begin to line up with the, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will use the symbols of the world to express this divine love. And that's what we call the fruits of the Spirit. That's the only reason we're really here, is to kind of clear our mind of all kind of ego distractions, distortions, attack thoughts, grievances, anything that would block the light in our mind, our only purpose is clear it away. And let that pure light just stream through our, our awareness. And then, when we do that, we let it look, however it looks. I remember, um, we've got a lot of movies to choose from here, but I remember, uh, it was probably a couple years ago, uh, Helen and I were down in Australia, and some friends of ours <coughs> said, let's go to the movies, and so we went to this theater, and you know those old theater curtains, you know? It's just one of these old-time theaters with the curtains and everything, and we're just sitting there waiting. And, and Helena started to get this feeling about the movie. She started to get sick uh, just <laughs> being in the movie theater. And we didn't even know, if you ever go to the movie and you just go in because you, you think the, the title sounds kind of cool, but you have no clue whatsoever, you haven't seen the trailer, you have no, absolutely no awareness of what the movie is. So we go in there, we're sitting there, she says, no, I don't know, I don't feel too good here and everything, and the curtains hadn't even pulled open to show the movie. And the movie was Knowing, with Nicolas Cage. Okay. It was an end of the world <laughs> movie. <laughs> it was so cool, I just loved that movie. I think it, I was like, oh God, that is a good movie. Why is it such a good movie? It's because, we can even watch some clips of it if you want to watch a little bit of it. It was so good because Knowing was about the idea that the Course teaches in the workbook, that the script is written. You know, that's really what it was about. It was, it was done so well, because it involved so many prophecies, 
of, of actual, we could say, events, catastrophes, disasters that would occur, and how many people would die in the catastrophes, and they were all, you could say, dead on. <laughs> they were all dead on. With the World Trade Center, with every you know, tsunami, with every earthquake, with every fire, with every storm, and everything, the, the event, the coordinates of where the event would occur on Earth were given, and the, the exact time, the exact date was given, and how many people would die. It was like those three pieces of information were given, and it was unfolding before the main character, Nicolas Cage's eyes, and he was watching the whole thing, and and then they, they followed the prophecy out until it, it stopped. At one point, the prophecies just stopped, and that was puzzling, like, what does that mean? And after all these numbers and coordinates, it just went on and on and on with great accuracy, and at the end, all it had was two letters at the end. E-E. -E. Nicholas Cage is like, E-E? -E? What could E-E -E possibly mean? What it meant was, everyone else. <laughs> oh, no more need for coordinates after that one. Everyone else. So, you know, to the world's perspective, it's like, oh, it's one of those doomsday predictions, you know, and so on and so forth, even though it, the children were taken up by the angels uh, to another planet and, and so on and so forth, where it was seemed to be like a, a rebirth kind of an idea. Adam and Eve as children, <laughs> the, ch the little boy and the little girl were taken up. But to me, the joy of that is, where is the joy in that? What's the joy of, of the script is written? What is the joy of everything is predetermined? What is the joy of, of the world will come to an end? In the sense that the Course is teaching us that the good news about the script is written is that you can stop using your mind's energy to change the world. I mean, really, think about it. If you knew that the script was written, if you knew that everything that seems to be your choice in this world, who you're going to date, who you're going to marry, what foods you're going to eat, where you're going to live your life, and all these things, was all part of a prearranged script. You know, wouldn't you take a sigh of, okay, I'm going to take it easy now. Because if the script is written, I'm not going to try to promote anything, I'm not going to try to make anything happen, I'm not going to try to prevent anything, getting easier and easier. Don't have to prevent anything. If you really took the script as written out to the full extent, you would see that it's actually an invitation to your mind to have peace, to find acceptance, to actually begin to really truly relax. Because so much energy is, is put into changing the body, improving the body, changing the world, improving the world, improving the environment. Uh, improving fill in the blank, you know, there's a lot of mind energy and what you can do is you can take that mind energy and you can more go, you can introspect with it, you can start to say if, if I'm not happy, what is it that I'm still believing in, in which I'm bringing about my own unhappiness? I don't even have to look for the cause in the world anymore, I can take it inward and just like, what, how am I perceiving this, that I am upset? You know, I can aim it, I can take my focus, and I can go inward with it, and that's where the release comes. And, and with A Course in Miracles, that's just one tool among many. There's many, many, many beautiful tools in this world. That's just one, one among the many that is just kind of a direct pathway inward, that is just giving you those gentle reminders all the time, like, it's just, it's your consciousness, it's your awareness, it's your mind. You know, if you had to summarize the course, it would be, mind your mind. <laughs> you know, pay attention to your mind. Don't get distracted with the world. Practice paying attention to your mind. Pay attention to how you feel. Pay attention to your, your thoughts. Pay attention to your decisions. Uh, that you're worth it. You know, having a clean mind is, is no small thing. 
as Lisa was saying, peace of mind is no small, is no idle gift. You know, peace of mind is precious and we need to invest in our mind training. There's really nothing that you could, you could invest in that would be more helpful than mind training. That's why, you know, you can see we, we work through a lot of things in this community and we go through a lot of darkness and a lot of darkness gets flushed up. But, our perspective is, what's, is there any better use of time than that? Some people might say, yeah, but I could think of a few better things than flushing up unconscious guilt. And we're like, let's be about it, you know? There's nothing else going, it's the only game in town. You know, flush, flush, flush. You know, we use the movies for the flushing, we use the relationships, we use whatever tasks we have, we use whatever projects, it's all just for flushing up and allowing giving ourselves permission, allowing it to come up so we can recognize it and let it go. You know, you can't release something that you aren't even aware of. If you've got ego defense mechanisms that are completely pushed out of awareness, well, you know, how are you going to let them go? I don't know what they are, but I'm going to let them go. <laughs> you know, it's like, that just doesn't work. You can, you can affirm, you can affirm all kinds of beautiful things, but it's, you know, it's kind of like that Michael Ledwith in the movie, What the Bleep Do We Know? You know, he's, he's talking about positive thinking is just like a smear, you know, drawn over the negative. It doesn't, it doesn't have any impact whatsoever if you have a whole unconscious belief system and you're just using affirmations to kind of, you know, put little, little sprinklers, you know, and like you put on your ice cream kind of little jimmies, little sprinklers, and it, it's... You know, it's not going to give you peace of mind. You know, it can you know, twinkle a little bit there, but it's not. You know, it's not going to get you to everlasting life. <laughs> you know, it doesn't get the job done. So, okay. So um, maybe since you've all been having your expression sessions, you can tell me that was our our introduction there with Jason Bourne starting to get in touch with his decisions. With uh, Albert Finney playing the character, you volunteered. You came to us. Next time you start to get angry and you feel like you're abused by somebody or abused by the world, just remember those words, you volunteered. You came to us. You, you chose to come here. But this is bizarre. Yes, you chose bizarre. That's a good word, and you chose it. So the feelings that you're experiencing, because because it's it's all rest on choice. We we can't blame and we can't blame God, we can't blame our parents, we can't blame our previous incarnations. <laughs> you know, we can't blame anything when we start to realize that everything in the world without exception is there by our decision and we can learn how to make another decision. Make a, a, a decision to forgive instead of holding on to these kind of mistreatment, abuse, woe is me, I got it, I had it hard, you think you had it bad, I had it worse, da 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 you know, kind of commiserating, you know, in, oh, I, ain't I got it bad, and the spirit's just like, ha ha ha, no, no, it's, it's all based on decision.